Well, Shalom Hadavarniks. Welcome to Hadavar Messianic Ministries and our School of Biblical and Jewish Studies. We're studying the prophet Ezekiel, the 2022 edition, and this is session 13, and session 13 begins in chapter 13 and verse 5. So let's review where we were when we entered chapter 13. Uh, first of all, we saw that as we entered chapter 13, we saw that God was offended at these false prophets in Israel, and they had offended him through five different means, five different means. The first means was in verse two, where they prophesied from their own inspiration. In other words, they made up prophecies. This came out of their own mind. And an example of that was uh, this book published in 1983 called Exodus 2, that prophesied the coming of the Jewish people out of Russia. The only problem was, while Jewish people did come out of Russia, they didn't follow the plans laid out in Exodus 2. They came out in a very different manner, so Exodus 2 was a false prophecy. Then in chapter 3, the next offense against God is they prophesied out of their own spirit. In other words, the prophecies were generated by their own emotions, their own emotional excesses. In verse 3, also verse 3, Ezekiel states that they offended God because they have seen nothing. This is the third offense against God. Their prophecies were geared to, to deception. They knew. They, they knew nothing was going to happen. They were simply interested in deceiving the population. <clears throat> and why did they do that? Why do people prophesy from these sources? Well, the answer comes in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately wicked, desperately sick. Who can understand it? So prophecy can be generated from your desperately sick, and we must accept this. You know, we are, are the heart of man is desperately sick and, and wicked, you know. Prophecy can be generated from your desperately sick mind, like in verse 2. You can imagine a revelation. Or it can be generated from your desperately sick emotions in verse 3. You can generate a vision or a dream emotionally because of emotional excess. And number three, the third offense, prophecy can, gen can be generated from your desperately sick will. In other words, you can generate it to deliberately deceive others. And why do pe some people engage in false prophecy? Well, the answer comes for power prestige, and or profit. Be very careful with prophets, folks. Be very careful. Uh, we, they must be tested and checked to make sure that they, are, that they are legitimate. And so I ask you, I'm not a prophet, I'm just a teacher, but I ask you, my students, to check out what I teach you. Uh, analyze it carefully, think it through. Make sure that you're comfortable with all that I teach you. Not because I'm up on the, on the internet, but because of the content that I'm teaching. All right, so those are, four offen are uh, three offenses. Then in verse 4, there's a fourth offense. The prophets are like foxes among the ruins. Now, what does a fox have to do with this? Well, we, real we learn from the rabbinic commentary in the New Testament. Rabbi Samuel Locks shares with us, that in rabbinic sources, the epithet fox, or the figure of the fox in parables, connotes one who is inferior, as when comparing a fox and a lion, or it describes one who is sly and double dealing. Sly and double dealing. That's what these false prophets were. All right, so this brings us to the new material. Now we come to the fifth offense against God in verse 5. Speaking to the false prophets, you have not gone up into the breaches, nor did you build the wall around the house of Israel to stand in the battle on the day of the Lord. Now the picture here is a city under siege, and the, the false prophets are pictured as not going up into the gaps. They've not stood in the breaches of the wall to defend the weak spots in the wall. They didn't build up the wall for the house of Israel. They didn't add to the defense. And of course, here's that picture. This is the relief of the Assyrian siege of Lachish. Here's the, the defenders on the wall. Here in Lachish, they did go up on the wall to defend the city. 
And uh, here is the battering ram trying to batter down the weak point in the wall. And they did build up their walls to try and keep the Assyrians out. But this didn't happen in Jerusalem. And the result, the city cannot stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. Ah, we get a time indicator here, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is the most common biblical name for the great tribulation. And the point, the point here is that the prophets, the false prophets, have set a pattern that will cause Israel to enter the tribulation. See, right now Ezekiel is prophesying in his present time, in verse 4. But in verse 5, he jumps ahead really quick to give us this quick glimpse at the tribulation period. The problem is the leadership of the nation. They will lead the nation to ruin throughout their history right up into the tribulation period. Now, the pattern was set in the past. What was set in Ezekiel's day will continue. It'll continue on into the first century. And there, the leadership will reject the messiahship of Jesus. See, this is the problem with the nation, the leadership of the nation. So in the first century, Jewish leadership rejected the Messiahship of Yeshua. Matthew 12, 22 through 24 is the initial rejection of his Messiahship. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Yeshua, and he healed him, so that the mute man spoke and saw. All the crowds were amazed and were saying, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? Now, healing a demon-possessed man who made the man, the demon who made the man blind and mute, healing this kind of a problem was considered by the rabbis a messianic miracle. They could cast out demons, but they couldn't cast out a demon of blindness and muteness. That's because their technique was to gain power over the demon by learning the name of the demon, and then with that authority over the demon, they would cast it out. But if the demon causes the man to be mute, they couldn't learn the name of the demon, therefore they were powerless against the demon. So the rabbis reason that since in the kingdom, in the kingdom, all diseases will be healed, that means that the, when the Messiah comes and sets up his kingdom, then he will be able to heal a, a demon-possessed man who's blind and mute. Well, the messianic miracle occurs. Jesus heals a blind and mute, demon-possessed man, and the crowds, you see, are amazed because they've been taught that that's a messianic miracle. They ask the right question. This man cannot be the son of David, can he? They're asking, is this guy the Messiah? But when the Pharisees heard this, now they give their, their twist on the, uh, on the um, healing of the demon. They said, this man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the real ruler of the demons. So there's the initial rejection of the Messiahship of Yeshua. He is, he is uh, doing his miracles in the power of of Satan. He's doing power, and he's, the, the um, Holy Spirit is being insulted because they're saying that the power that healed this man comes from Satan. He's demon-possessed. Jesus is demon-possessed is basically the accusation here. And you can, uh, you can learn more about this if you uh, study our class on the Jewish life of the Messiah. When you get to Matthew 12, we will go, with this, go into this in detail including rabbinic material. All right, so that's the uh, initial rejection of the Messiahship of Jesus in the first century. John 11, 47 through 53, comes to the final rejection. Therefore, and this is because of the resurrection of Lazarus, therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council, and they were saying, what are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. Now he did not say this on his own initiative. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Yeshua was going to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. So, from that day on, they planned together to kill him. 
There's the initial and the final rejection of Yeshua in the first century. But this problem with the leadership is going to continue. It's going to continue on into the future, and the leadership will cause the, na the nation to eventually enter into the tribulation period. Now, what I'm going to briefly share with you in the next few moments can be found in detail in Dr. Fruchtenbaum's book, The Footsteps of the Messiah. I recommend this uh, book on uh, Revelation and End Times Prophecy very, very highly. It's the best one I've ever read. But in, this, in the book, you'll read about Isaiah 28, 15, and 18, <clears throat> where Israel makes a covenant with the Antichrist, and it is that covenant with the Antichrist that begins the tribulation. Here's the account in Isaiah 28, 15. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death, that's a reference to the covenant with the Antichrist, and with Sheol we have made a pact, so they made a, a covenant with death and hell, and they say they're confident that this covenant will protect them. We've made this covenant, the overwhelming scourge, now that is the, uh, a picture of a military invasion. The overwhelming scourge will not reach us when it passes by. For we have made falsehood our refuge, we have concealed ourselves with deception. So the leaders of Israel feel they're safe from the Antichrist, safe when his armies are conquering the world. What does God think of this covenant? In verse 18, God says, Your covenant with death will be canceled. Your pact with Sheol will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge, and that's in the middle of the tribulation, the attack by the Antichrist armies to wipe out the Jewish nation totally, when the overwhelming scourge passes through, then you become its trampling place. And there, the Antichrist armies will eventually trample Jerusalem. The times of the Gentiles is still in force. That's a definition of the times of the Gentiles. Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot until the times of the Gentiles is completed. And so there's the, there's the connection. Jerusalem will become trampled. However, however, at the end of the tribulation, uh, good will come. And this is in Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great. There is none like it. It is the time of Jacob's trouble. That's a reference to Israel entering the tribulation period. But Jeremiah also receives the revelation, but he, that is Jacob, the Jewish people, will be saved from it. So there's the promise. The tribulation may come, the Antichrist may come, the, the covenant with death will be annulled, but the Jewish people will survive. And at the end of the tribulation will come the national regeneration of Israel. The first step is that we need to call on Yeshua. This is uh, discover, discussed in Matthew 23, 37 through 39, and Yeshua is speaking. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those, those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling. We rejected his Messiahship. We rejected the Messiahship of Yeshua. Behold, here's the results. Your house is being left to you desolate. That's a reference to uh, the temple and to Jerusalem. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until you say, well, we will see him again, but it won't be until we say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's the great messianic greeting that we're taught to call out when Messiah comes. Baruch HaBab Hashem Aronai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's exactly what we will do and that will occur in um, the last three days of the tribulation. And uh, Reve uh, Romans 11, 25 through 27 sums it all up. I don't want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until, that's that key word, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. When the last Gentile to be saved in God's uh, omniscient knowledge, when the last Gentile is saved, then the, the second coming begins, and all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So Israel will be saved physically as uh, God returns 
uh, to Zion. The deliverer comes to Zion and rescues us from the um, Antichrist armies, but we will also be saved spiritually when ungodliness and sin are removed from our lives. All right, let's move on now uh, to the sixth, seventh, and eighth offenses in verses six through seven. And so now at this point, we jump from that quick look in the tribulation back to the present time in verse six through 16 too for these additional offenses against God by the false prophets. So we come to the first statement in verse six. They see falsehood and lying divination who are saying, the Lord declares, when the Lord has not sent them, yet they hope for the fulfillment of their word. So they've seen falsehood and lying divina divination. They know what's going on. They know their visions are demonic and not of divine origin. And you know, a, a, a demon can do that. And demons have caused false prophets to prophesy. An example is 1 Kings 22. My, my, Micaiah said, therefore hear the word of the Lord. This is a true prophet now. And he's, he's um, explaining the truth of the situation. He said, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne and all the host of heaven standing by him and on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab? And uh, my, Micaiah is, is prophesying before wicked King Ahab here. Who will entice Ahab to go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said to this, and one, while another said that. Then a spirit came forward before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, well, how? And he said, I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And then he said, you are to entice him and also prevail. Go and do so. So here we have this uh, deceiving spirit in the mouth of the false prophets. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets. And the Lord has proclaimed disaster against you. So that's happened before when the demons caused false prophets to uh, speak their prophecies of lies. All right, now in verse six again, we come to the seventh offense, the Lord says, the Lord declares. Well, this is the right formula, this is the right claim, but the Lord had not sent them. This correct claim is a lie. They are self-commissioned and self-called. They're not called and commissioned by God. That's offensive to the Lord. And then the eighth offense is in the same verse, the re, the, and it speaks of the result of their false prophecies, yet they hope for the fulfillment of their word. These false prophets gave hope, false hope to the people. They encouraged false security. And that was offensive to God too, because that was not the truth. So now God, God comes forth with an accusing question in verse seven. Did you not see a false vision and speak a lying divination when you said, the Lord declares, but it is not I who have spoken? So two rhetorical questions start the verse. Have you seen a false vision? Yeah, they don't have to answer, they know it's false. Have you not spoken a lying divination? Yes, they don't even have to answer. The question is rhetorical. The answer is yes to both of them. So the accusation, you have lied about your authority, you've lied about your call, you've lied about your commission, and you defamed my name as you lied. That's the accusation. And the judgment comes in verses eight through 16. We start with the indictment in verse eight. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the Lord God, because you have spoken falsehood and seen a lie, therefore behold, I am against you, declares the Lord God. Okay, so this is the indictment. You've spoken falsehood, you've seen lies, I have become your enemy. And so the punishment is in the first part of verse nine. So my hand will be against the prophets who see false visions and utter lying divinations. They will have no place in the council of my people, nor will they be written down in the register of the house of Israel, nor will they enter the land of Israel that I may know and that, that they may know that I am the Lord. So the, the punishment is in the first part of the verse. Um, his hand will be against the prophets. And then in the second part of the verse, there's three aspects to the punishment. 
First, they'll not be in the council of my people. The point, they will lose influence with the people when the people understand that they're lying. When the people finally come to, to get an idea of what's really going on, they're going to reject the false prophets. Secondly, they're not going to be written down in the register of the house of Israel. And the point, they're going to be excommunicated from the citizenry of Israel. And they will be excommunicated from the priesthood as well. Ezra 2.62 speaks of that. And thirdly, thirdly, neither the, shall they enter the land of Israel. The point, they will not be part of the return in 70 years. But there will be a positive result, not for their lives, but for their understanding. You will know that I am the Lord. When all this comes to pass, exactly as predicted, then they'll say, okay, this came from God. This came from God. And so their crime is, in verse 10, giving the people a false sense of security. This, it is definitely because they have misled my people by saying peace, when there is no peace. And when anyone builds a wall, behold, they plaster it over with whitewash. Okay, definitely because. This is very, very emphatic in the Hebrew. Definitely because they deceived the people into thinking there was nothing to worry about. So the prophets are guilty of a whitewash. <laughs> and that picture there is of a wall. And when one builds up a wall, that's a symbol of the people. When one builds up a wall... Uh, and that's a symbol of, the, actually, I should say, the vain hopes of the people. It's like a wall. Nothing's going to happen. We're protected. And this wall consists of stones heaped up one upon the other, but they're not cemented together. The best thing you could do is to put mortar between the stones. But the false prophets are not doing this in this illustration. They're the wall builders. They're building false security for the people. But they daub it with whitewash with white paint, you know, wh whitewash, white paint is useless for strength. You know, white paint looks nice, but it provides no strength to the wall. And so the prophets predict the fulfillment, fulfillment of these hopes. These are false hopes. This wall, these hopes of the people, this wall is very, 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 very weak. It's ready to totter and crash to the ground. And that's exactly what's going to happen in verse 11. So tell those who plaster it over with whitewash that it will fall. A flooding rain will come and, and you, O hailstones, will fall. And violent wind will break out. So here's the destruction of the wall. God will cause the wall to fall. It's his decree. And then he describes various uh, elements that come against the wall, the flood. And... Uh, that's a symbol of a military invasion and the hailstones and the stormy wind. Again, all uh, pictures of the military invasion by the Babylonians and all fulfilled by the Babylonians. So the wall will fall. The false hopes of the people will be dashed to the ground and the false prophets will be exposed in verse 12. Behold, when the wall has fallen, will you not be asked, where's the plaster with which you plastered it? So the wall is destroyed, and the people who have been putting their hope in the prophecy of these false prophets are going to ask, where's the mortar you should have used? So they're mocking the false prophets. They're mocking them for their lies. This statement, this question is dripping with sarcasm and bitterness. Apparently the false prophets had said something like, you know, there's a wall there, you're protected. And so now the people are coming back and saying, oh, where's the plaster which strengthened the so-called wall you built? Yeah. Dripping with sarcasm and bitterness. And so the false prophets will be held accountable for their lies and deception. And in addition, the prophets will fall along with their wall. This is in verses 13 and 14. We begin with the means of destruction in verse 13. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the Lord God, I will make a violent wind break out in my wrath, and there will also be in my anger a flooding rain and hailstones to consume it in wrath. Okay, and so God repeats that he will destroy this wall. And again, these are all pictures of the Babylonian judgment, the hailstones, the rain, the violent wind. 
And then the destruction is detailed again in verse 14. So I will tear down the wall which you plastered over with white paint, with whitewash, and bring it down to the ground so that its foundation is laid bare. And now he adds, he adds to the prophecy, and when it falls, you will be consumed in its midst, and you will know that I am the Lord. Okay, so it's going to fall, but the fall of the wall is also going to bring about the fall of the false prophets, and they are going to be destroyed. And um, any of them that live will realize that it is God who did this. It is the Lord who is the only, the only powerful and only wise God there is. Because they'll see that the prophecies of Ezekiel come to pass while they knew that their prophecies were false. And this will accomplish then the, the wrath of God in verses and 15 and 16. And so the wall and the prophets are no more in verse 15. Thus I will spend my wrath on the wall and on those who have plastered it over with whitewash. And I will say to you, the wall is gone and the plasterers are gone. So he's going to accomplish his will, his wrath. He's going to bring about a judgment and he will declare that the wall is gone and neither, and so are the false prophets. And then he identifies very clearly the prophets in verse 16, along with the prophets of Israel who prophesy in Jerusalem and who see visions of peace for her when there is no peace, declares the Lord God. So here he's identifying additional prophets, the prophets of Israel who prophesy concerning Jerusalem. They see visions of peace for her true. These are, these are prophets outside the city walls, but there will be no peace. So all the prophets, those inside the city, those outside the city, all of them will be exposed and perish. But men are not the only false prophets. Uh, issuing a false prophecy is an equal opportunity deception then and today. And so now God's attention turns to the false prophetesses, to the false prophets who are women. And so the objects of his prophecy comes out in verse 17. Now you son of man, set your face against who? The daughters of your people who are prophesying from their own inspiration. Prophesy against them. So here the, the picture is now on the women. The women that are prophesying out of their, their own heart. They too were self-called. They too were self-commissioned. They too make up prophecies out of their imagination. Now this is the only place in the, uh, in the prophets, in the, in the writings of the prophets, where false prophetesses are mentioned. But like today, there they were. They were in Jerusalem in 586 BC. False prophets, women who are false prophets. Okay, the occult practices that they're Active, active with is in verse 18, and say, thus says the Lord God, woe to the women who sew magic bands on all wrists and make veils for the heads of persons of every stature to hunt down lives. Will you hunt down the lives of my people, but preserve the lives of others for yourselves? Now, this is a very difficult verse, and the commentators, <clears throat> and the commentators admit that, but the, probably the best thing, the best interpretation is that woe to the women who are creating magic charms. That would be a good generic rendering of the Hebrew. We don't know exactly what they were doing here. Perhaps they were creating magical bands to put on the wrists, the wrists of the inquirer to symbolize the binding power of, of incantations. This would be very similar to the uh, red Kabbalah strings we've talked about previously. Remember in my article in the International Jerusalem Post, there was the article for Kabbalah for cash, and there they were selling the Kabbalah red thread. And this red thread is to be worn around your left hand, and it negates the evil eye. It protects you from the evil eye, the red strings of Kabbalah. Now here's a little more information on that. Uh, you, can, you can read about this in, at www.kabbalah.com. The red string is used for protection against what the Zohar terms the evil eye. A person possessed of an evil eye carries with him jealousy and envy, a destroying force. 
Be on your guard not to come near him. He may injure you. So this is protection from somebody who has an evil eye. You, you take a red string and you put it around your, you put it around your wrist. Well, where should our protection come from? Should it come from a red string around our wrist? No. Psalm 46, 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. That's where we go for protection. And Psalm 121, 7. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. But these women, back in, in Ezekiel's day, were not heeding the instructions of Psalm 46 and Psalm 121 and many others. And it's still true today as well. As you saw, red Kabbalah strings are being sold and you can buy them on the internet just about anywhere you want. That superstition is being sold today and um, people actually believe it, that these red strings will protect you from the evil eye. All right. These women, perhaps these women were thinking they were protecting themselves from God's judgment. Perhaps that, that, that's what was going on in Ezekiel's day. Perhaps they thought they were hampering God's judgment to buy these magic charms or, to, or these women to create these magic charms. But you know, when the women do that, they cover up and conceal the word of God when they issue false prophecies. All right, back in verse 18, they also made veils veils for the heads of persons of every stature in order to hunt souls. Well, a better translation is probably cloaks. These could be veils, but maybe cloaks might be better. Cloaks worn by women when they engaged in ritual. So these are custom-made cloaks or veils. We're not sure exactly what they are. But by means of rituals and spells and incantations, they captivate their clients and they claim the power to keep them alive. Why did they keep, uh, claim the power to keep them alive? By the payment of large sums of money. And in verse 19, we come to the indictment. For handfuls of barley and fragments of bread, you have profaned me to my people to put to death some who should not die and to keep others alive who should not live by your lying to my people who listen to lies. So there's a threefold indictment going on in verse 19. First of all, you have profaned me among my people for handfuls of barley and bread. Barley and bread. The food here was payment for the divination. This was their payment for the divination. They used divination to see if a sick man would live or die. You know, am I going to live or die? Well, pay me, a, pay, me, pay me some barley, pay me some bread, you know. So they did it to gain wealth. The second admonition here, the second indictment here, they put to death some who should not die. <clears throat> they, used, they even used occult magical powers to kill people. And occult powers are real, and that can happen. So they were actually uh, murdering people using their occult powers. And then third, to keep others alive who should not live. So the magic occultic cures would cure people who would otherwise die. And the means for all of this, the means for all this uh, gruesome uh, spiritual transgressions is lying to my people that hearken, who listen to the lies. So some of the people were listening to the lies, paying attention to all this, believing all this stuff. So the judgment comes in verses 20 through 23. It'll come against the, uh, the occult practices. This, uh, this uh, corresponds to the verse 18, and it is a difficult verse as well. So we start with verse 20. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against your magic bands by which you hunt lives, which you hunt lives there as birds, and I will tear them down, I tear them from your arms, and I will let them go, even those lives whom you hunt as birds. So the judgment comes against the magic charms. So the best possibility is that God is going to break the power of these magic charms and tear the magic charms from people's arms. And he will let the souls go, the, the souls that you are hunting like birds. He's going to rescue innocent people from this occultic activity that's going on. And verse 21 
I will also tear your veils and deliver my people from your hands that they will no longer be in your hands to be hunted and you will know that I am the Lord. So now the veils are the cloaks God, uh, or cloaks or veils that these people have made, these women have made. They're going to be torn apart by the, by the Lord. And uh, when he tears them apart, you will know that I am the Lord. They'll be freed from bl blindness imposed by the witchcraft. They will see that their witchcraft is false. They shouldn't, and uh, hopefully they will learn that they should trust in the Lord and not in this kind of occultic activities. Now, the means of deliverance is in verses 22 and 23. We start with the basis of punishment in verse 22. Because you disheartened the righteous with falsehood when I did not cause him grief, but have encouraged the wicked not to turn from his wicked way and preserve his life. So these occult practices grieved the righteous and cheered on the wicked. And the wicked were emboldened, thinking that the superstitious magic protected them from divine judgment. Such garbage. And people believe in the Kabbalah red strings today. They wear those things thinking that God will protect them, that somehow a piece of red string is going to protect them. Well, these people did the same, and they were emboldened to do so. They were, they were encouraged to do so. So the punishment comes in verse 23. Therefore, you women will no longer see false visions or practice divination, and I will deliver my people out of your hand. Thus, you will know that I am the Lord. Okay, therefore, because of verse 22, because you've uh, discouraged the righteous and em emboldened the unrighteous, you will no longer see these visions and divinations, and I'll deliver my people out of your hand. And again, the result, you'll know that I am the Lord. They'll see that they are actually powerless and um, they should be trusting in the Lord instead of in this occultism. Well, this brings us now to chapter 14, chapter 14. And we get a look at an at a incident with the idolatrous elders in Babylon in chapter 14, verses 1 through 11. So we begin with a rebuke in verses one through five of these elders. And the, so the elders in verse one come to Ezekiel, Ezekiel 14, one. Then some elders of Israel came to me and sat down before me. Now these are, remember, these are the elders of the exile. They're coming to Ezekiel. Now this is a second time. And they come to inquire of the word of the Lord. Now this is necessary since Ezekiel's ministry was close to home. He was not to go out into the city and uh, preach in the, in the streets and seek out the elders. It shows that Ezekiel had attracted a lot of attention already, you know, through his, uh, his signs. So they begin to recognize his prophetic authority. So now they come to him. And when they come to him, the word of the, God, uh, the, word of the Lord also comes to Ezekiel. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, <clears throat> So the word of the Lord comes, not to answer the elders' questions, but to condemn these elders. And their sin begins with idolatry in the heart, verse 3. Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts and have put right before their faces the stumbling block of their iniquity. Should I be consulted by them at all? So the idolatry is exposed is expressed in two ways. First of all, they've they have idols in their heart. This is internal idolatry. Their inner man is committed to idolatry. Their inner man trusts in the idolatry and believes it's true. And uh, the idolatry is described by a very colorful Hebrew word. The Hebrew word for the word idols there is the word meaning balls of excrement. <laughs> balls of excrement. It's kind of a colorful insult. These idols are nothing but a pile of poop. That's all they are. And secondly, these men have put a stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. This is a reference to the external worshiping of the idols. So internally they're committed to these idols. Externally they are actually performing rituals and giving offerings and like incense, etc. to these idols. And so God asks a question, a rhetorical question. Should I be inquired? Should I be consulted by them at all? 
This shows the purpose of their coming. Their purpose of their coming was to ask questions of Ezekiel, uh, adding by adding the Lord to their pantheon. You know, they had all these idols that they worship. Well, we'll add the Lord to him. We'll pray to him too, you know. And so the answer, of course, is an obvious no. God will not answer their questions. Instead, he will rebuke them. And so in verses four and five, we come to God's answer. We start in first part of verse four. Therefore, speak to them and tell them, thus says the Lord God. So speak God's message to them. And the message is a message of warning, starting in the second half of verse four. Any man of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart and puts right before his face the stumbling block of his iniquity and then comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will be brought to give him an answer in the matter in view of the multitude of his idols. So here we have the warning to the idolatrous elders. They have idols in their hearts. They're internally trusting in these idols and they put a stumbling block before their face. That's the external worship of the idols. And then they come to a true prophet. I, the Lord, is gonna answer them according to the multitude of their idols. The answer will come by deeds. The answer will come through the results of their idolatry, the consequences of their idolatry. In other words, they're going to reap what they sow. As you have worship, worshiped idols, so I will respond to you. You will reap what you sow. And the result is in verse five. In order to lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel who are estranged from me through all their idols. Now, how is God gonna do this? God is going to bring the consequences of idolatry on them. God will allow idol the idols to grasp their hearts so securely and so badly they will be convinced of the need to turn to God. When they're sick of this idol worship, they'll finally turn to God. Reminds, reminds me of a, a friend of my son's <laughs> when he was in elementary school. Uh, his friend loved macaroni and cheese. And so one day this friend told his parents, I don't wanna eat nothing but macaroni and cheese. I'm not gonna eat anything but macaroni and cheese. And parents very wisely said, okay. <laughs> and they fed him macaroni and cheese, morning, noon, and night, day after day after day. Finally, he got very quickly, he got sick of macaroni and cheese. Well, that's what God is going to do here. You know, there he, he's going to let them worship their idols until they're disgusted with it. But God is going to hold them responsible for what's in their mind. You know, sin starts in our minds, doesn't it, folks? Matthew 15, 18. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from where? The heart internally. And those defile the man. For out of the heart comes what? Evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. There's the problem. The problem starts in the heart. These are the things which defile the man. But to eat with unwashed hands, this is the external activity, does not defile the man. Dirty hands don't defile you, the man. And James says the same thing. But each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by what? His own lust. That's internal. And when lust has conceived, when that lust is floating around in your brain, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it, it brings forth death. So sin starts in the mind. He's gonna hold them responsible. And the reason is because of all who are estranged from me through their idols. All who have become strangers uh, you know, the word there is zur, it's, um, it's to be a stranger, to not be related. Uh, many of the people who trust in these idols, listening to the elders, have trusted in the idols. They're no longer related to God. They're estranged from God. Isaiah 59, 2. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. There's the same idea. And your sins have hidden his face from you, so he does not hear. Yeah, that's what sin does. It, it puts up a barrier between us and God. God is absolutely holy. He will have no truck with sin. It's through his gracious love that he saves the sinner, that he saves the sinner. So our heavenly father, Israel's heavenly father, your heavenly father, my heavenly father, grieves 
over the separation that sin brings. And here in the book of Ezekiel, he's working for reconciliation. That's the whole point for what he does. He wants to reconcile uh, the Jewish people to himself. That's why he sent Yeshua for us, for all of us in the first century and in 2023, you know. He sent us to, so we, he sent his son to die so we can be reconciled to him. This is the love of God and the heart of our Father. Well, let's get back to Ezekiel here. When we get back to Ezekiel, we count now come in verses 6 through 11 to the judgment. But the judgment starts with a call to repentance. God desires reconciliation. Therefore, he issues a call to repentance. Change your mind. Change your ways. Come back to me. Verse 6. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, repent. Turn away from your idols. Turn your faces away from all your abominations. Okay, because of the warning in verses four and five, he issues three pleas. The first plea is to repent. This is a, a decision of the will. And then number two, turn, turn from the idols, and that speaks of internal repentance. Make a decision in your mind, and then turn internally from your idols, have internal repentance, and then turn your faces away from your ab um, abominations. That's the external actions that come from repentance, that come from uh, uh, a de decision in the heart. Turn away from your actions. Failure to repent is gonna result in judgment, we learn in verses seven and eight. They're going to be held responsible to make the decision to repent. They're already under judgment for their idol worship. And the only way they can get out of judgment is to turn to God in faith, to repent of what they've been doing and confess it, and then start living in a manner that is consistent with their internal change. And of course, if the internal change is genuine, their external activities will follow suit. Anyway, we come to the sin in verse 7. For anyone of the house of Israel or of the immigrants who stay in Israel, who separates himself from me and sets up his idols in his heart and puts right before his face the stumbling block of his iniquity, and then comes the prophet to, acquire, to inquire of me for himself. So everyone is included here. Those in the house of Israel, that's the Jewish people, the Jewish community number one, and number two, the strangers that sojourn in Israel, these are Gentiles who are living in the land of Israel. And then God defines the offenders very, very clearly. He separates himself from me, that's apostasy. He takes idols into his, into his heart, that's internal idolatry. He puts the stumbling block before him, that's the external practice. And then they come to the prophet to inquire of me, that's the chutzpah, that's the chutzpah, that's insolence or audacity. I, the Lord, will answer him. God will personally deal with this kind of individual. Verse 8. Excuse me, I didn't do verse 7. I, the Lord, will brought to answer him in my own person. So the point of verse 7 is God's going to personally deal with this kind of an individual. And now we move on to the punishment in verse 8. I will set my face against that man and make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from among my people, so you will know that I am the Lord. So oh, he's going to set his face personally against someone who does all this, and he'll become an astonishment and a sign and a proverb. So whoever undergoes this judgment will become famous. They'll become famous. The people will talk about him. Did you hear what happened to Jacob? Did you hear what happened to Aaron? They're gonna become famous. Why? Because I'm gonna cut him off from the midst of my people. He's speaking of physical death there, of execution. Did you hear what happened to Jacob? You become famous. But the result, you will know that I am the Lord. Not the idols, because the idols will not protect you. When the Babylonians come, you're gonna, you're gonna suffer ter terribly. <clears throat> And uh, this is all in keeping with the law of Moses. This is in keeping with the punishment for idolatry in the law of Moses. For example, Levit Leviticus 20, verses 1 through 6. 
Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You shall also say to the sons of Israel, Any man from the sons of Israel, or from the aliens sojourning in, sojourning in Israel, who gives any of his offspring to Moloch, that's an idol, a horrible idol, shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I will also set my face against that man and will cut him off from among the people because he has given some of his offspring to Moloch so as to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. If the people of the land, however, should ever disregard that man when he gives any of his offspring to Moloch so as not to put him to death, then I myself will set my face against that man and against his family. So even if the people don't follow through on their obligations to execute the man, God will step in. And I will cut off from among their people both him and all those who play the harlot after him by playing the harlot after Moloch. As for the people, as for the person who turns to mediums and to spiritists, so you've got idol worship there. Moloch is an example of idol worship. There were many different idols. But he also includes mediums and spiritists, you know, the occult practices that people even practice today. As for the person who turns to mediums and to spiritists to play the harlot after them, I will also set my face against that person and will cut him off from among his people. So it's a death penalty for the individuals who are involved. That's Leviticus 20 verses one through six. And then there's Deuteronomy 28, 36 and 37. The Lord will bring you and your king, whom you set over you, to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. See, this is deportation. This is one of the curses of the covenant. You shall become a horror and a proverb and a taunt among all the people where the Lord drives you. So for individuals who are involved in the occult, there's the death penalty. But for the nation in general, there's going to be captivity, diaspora, the punishment of captivity, Deuteronomy 28. Then we come to a description of divine deception, the, the divine deception of the false prophet in verse 9. But if the prophet is prevailed upon to speak a word, it is I, the Lord, who have prevailed upon that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand against him and destroy him from among my people Israel. So this is the principle of divine dealing. Now, God is not deceiving the false prophet to make him false. He's doing this because the prophet is already a false deceiver. He's, he's also a deceiver. He's also false. He's already that way. Again, 2 Kings uh, 22, 21 and 22. Then a spirit came forward and before the Lord and said, to, said, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, how? And he said, I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of his prophets, false prophets. Then he said, you will entice him and also prevail and you shall go. So the prophets in 2 Kings 22, they were already false prophets. And so this spirit from the Lord deceived them. So, in, so the divine deception was a punishment for their previous sins. In other words, you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Psalm 18, 25 and 26. With the kind, you, that's God, you show yourself kind. With the blameless, blameless you, Lord, show yourself blameless. With the pure, you, uh, Elohim, you, Adonai, you, Yahweh, you show yourself pure. And with the crooked, you show yourself astute. Literally, you show yourself twisted or shrewd. You reap what you sow. Kindness, you reap kindness. If you're blameless, you'll be blameless. If you're pure, you'll be, you will be shown to be pure. But if you're crooked, you'll, you'll be dealt with, God will deal with you in a twisted and shrewd way. He will deal with you exactly the way you deal with him. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, he will also reap. So God says, I'll stretch my hand out upon him in judgment, and I will destroy him in the midst of my people Israel. And this is uh, speaking there of physical death. And that's what happened with King Ahab. That's what happened with King Ahab. So as with the prophet, so with the inquirer in verse 10, 
They will bear the iniquity of the punishment of their iniquity as the iniquity of the inquirer is, so the iniquity of the prophet will be. So two people are held responsible. They shall bear the iniquity, both of them. It's just as wrong to inquire of a false prophet as it is to be a false prophet. You're not innocent if you go to a false prophet and start asking for advice from the occult side of the world, from the evil side, from the dark side of this world. But the purpose, the purpose for all this is in verse 11. In order that the house of Israel may no longer stray from me and no longer defile themselves with all their transgressions, thus they will be my people and I shall be their God, declares the Lord God. Again, this happens, this happens not because God is petty. It's not because God is vindictive and spoiled and cruel. God is not that way at all. But rather, God wants to bring his people back into relationship with him. He wants to, his, to redeem his people. He doesn't want them to defile themselves with transgressions. He wants to bring them back into obedience. Why? Ultimately, so they'll be my people and I'll be their God. He wants reconciliation and righteousness among the Jewish people. Reconciliation and righteousness. All right, well, I see that I've only got about four minutes left. And we kind of start a new topic at this point in verses 12 and 13. So I think I will call it quits right here. We'll call it quits right here. And um, we'll pick it up next session in chapter 14, verse 12 through 23. And the topic there will be the uselessness of intercession. You see, there comes a point in time where God ignores prayer. There comes a point in time when you step over the line and God acts. You see, our God, Yahweh, is a very loving, patient Father. But He does draw a line in the sand. And when you step over that, land, that line, then His wrath must come. He can't ignore. He can't just uh, poo-poo. He can't just excuse our sin and our unrighteousness. And so that's what we're going to look at as we get into chapter 14, verses 12. Uh, through 23. I think you'll find it fascinating and encouraging as we finish up chapter 14 and get into chapter 15. So we will see you next session. Thanks for being our students. Lahithraot. Lahithraot.